I was born in 1918 at the end of the World War I to Thomas Gibson Walton and Nancy Lee in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. I lived there with my parents at their farm until 1923. Farming didn't provide enough money for the entire family, so my father, Thomas Walton, went into farm mortgaging. He worked for his brother's Walton Mortgage Company, which was an agent for the Metropolitan Life Insurance where he foreclosed on farms during the Great Depression. We were a humble farming family, and we moved from one small town to another for several years, mostly in Missouri. Growing up during the Great Depression, I had to help achieve financial ends for my family, but I liked it. I always helped my parents and tried to reward them for everything they did for me. I had to milk the family cow, bottle the surplus, and deliver it to customers. Afterwards, I delivered the Columbia Daily Tribune newspapers on a paper route and sold magazine subscriptions. All of those tasks helped me as a child and from that moment, I knew that I want something different and something bigger, but I never imagined that I was going to change the world. I graduated in 1940 with a bachelor's degree in economics and I was voted permanent president of the class. A few days after graduation from college, I started my career when I took a job as a sales trainee at a JCPenney of Des Moines, Iowa. I was very excited about this job, but I was never one of Penny's most thorough employees. I hated making customers wait while I was dealing with documents, so my books were a mess. My boss even threatened to fire me, saying I wasn't cut out for retail work. I was saved by my abilities as a salesman and I added about $25 per month in commissions to my beginner's salary. I resigned from this job in 1942 when I enrolled to serve in World War II. Before joining the military, I worked at a DuPont ammunition factory near Tulsa, Oklahoma. I joined the U.S. Army Corps of Intelligence and I supervised security at aircraft factories during World War II. Here in the Army, I realized that I wanted to go into retailing and become a businessman. At the age of 26, after leaving the Army, I took over the management of my first variety store. With a $20,000 loan from my father-in-law, plus the $5,000 I saved, I bought a Ben Franklin variety store in Newport, Arkansas. My second store, the small Eagle store, was down the street from my first Ben Franklin store and next to my main competitor in Newport. With the help of my brother and father-in-law, I continued to open many new variety stores. By 1962, along with my brother Bud, I owned 16 stores in Arkansas, Missouri, and Kansas. But my success was followed by failure. When I signed the lease for my Ben Franklin Variety Store in 1945, due to inexperience and the excitement of becoming a merchant, I agreed to give back to the owner 5% of the sales. However, this failure never got to me as I always viewed any failures as lessons. Later, I discovered that this was the largest that any seller had paid for rent. I also neglected to add a lease clause to give me the option to renew my lease after five years. When the lease on the Ben Franklin store ended, the landlord refused to renew the lease. The owner bought Walton's well-stocked store with his equipment and inventory and transferred it to his son. At that moment, I was devastated and I saw how all my success turned into failure overnight. I had to pick myself up and get on with it, do it all over again, only even better this time. I opened my first real Walmart on July 2nd, 1962 in Rogers, Arkansas, named the Walmart Discount City Store. We aimed to find American manufacturers for the entire Walmart chain at a price low enough to face external competition. Keeping the price of the products low was one of the major driving forces behind the success of my Walmart stores. Over the next few years, several Walmart stores sprang up across the country, and by 1967, my family and I owned 24 stores, with sales of up to $12.7 million. Within a few years, I was able to officially incorporate the company as Walmart Stores, Inc. In order for my model to work, I focused on logistics, particularly locating stores within a day's drive of Walmart's regional warehouses and distributed through my own trucking service. 
buying in volume and efficient delivery permitted sale of discounted name brand merchandise. The company went public in 1970, and the first stock was sold for $16.50 a share. Until 1972, Walmart was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. By 1980, the company had annual sales of $1 billion. In the 80s, we launched the first Sam's Club to serve small businesses and individuals. In the same decade, we also opened the first Walmart Supercenter, combining a supermarket with general merchandise to provide one-stop shopping convenience. From 1982 to 1988, Forbes magazine named me the wealthiest man in the United States. I always knew that I could do great things, but I never dreamed of something like this. I enjoyed continued success in the years that followed. And in the early 1990s, the company's stock was $45 billion. Walmart became the largest national retailer in 1991, surpassing even Sears, Roebuck & Company. In 1992, I received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor from President George H.W. Bush. I salute you, sir, for your vision, and I am proud to give you your nation's highest civilian honor. I had a strong faith in giving back to society, and that is why I founded the Walmart Foundation in 1979. The purpose of this foundation was to contribute to disadvantaged people, focusing on the main areas of opportunity, sustainability, and community. My wife and I supported various charitable causes and worked at the First Presbyterian Church in Bentonville, where I served as a ruling elder and a Sunday school teacher. I didn't invent retailing just like Henry Ford didn't invent the automobile. But just as Ford's assembly line revolutionized America's service economy, my dogged pursuit of discounting revolutionized America's service economy. We have not only changed the way American shopping is done, but we have changed the philosophy of the American retail business institution, instigating the shift of power from manufacturer to consumer that has become prevalent in industry after industry. My pioneering concepts paved the way for a new breed of category killer retail. The Home Depots, Barnes and Nobles, and Blockbusters of the world, and forever changed the face of retailing. I've always been very competitive since I was a child, and this helped me to orient my thoughts towards success and to understand the importance of teamwork. I realized that the public exercise of the ego was not the right way to build a strong business, so I invested a lot in attracting the best, most talented and most loyal people to my team. I made a lot of mistakes, as we all do, but because of my positive thinking, I never blamed anyone but myself. I promised to learn from every mistake and spend twice as much time before making any important decision. Walmart stores have dominated the retail industry for years, but do you know who made me interested in such a business? My barber. The first rules I ever learned about retail work came from my barber and his brothers, who later grew their variety store into a chain of 60 stores. So be desperate to find out all about business and cling to those who know better than you. My name is Sam Walton, founder of one of the world's largest retail chains, Walmart, and I have a very important message for you. If you love your work, you'll be out there every day trying to do it the best you possibly can, and pretty soon everybody around will catch the passion from you like a fever. High expectations and hard work is the key for everything.